Welcome to If You Love This Planet. I'm Dr. Helen Caldicott, and in this program we talk about the greatest medical and environmental threats to all life, such as nuclear weapons and nuclear power, global warming, ozone depletion, toxic pollution, deforestation, and many other social and political issues that relate to global well-being. So if you love this planet, keep listening. Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today is Arnie Gunderson, an energy advisor with Fairwinds Associates, a company which provides research, analysis and paralegal services around environmental and energy issues. An independent nuclear engineering and safety expert, Arnie provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety and radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, congressional and state legislatures, and government agencies and officials throughout the US, Canada and internationally. He's been a leading voice globally about the impact of the Fukushima nuclear disaster and he joins us now. Arnie Gunderson, welcome to If You Love This Planet. Hi Helen, thank you for having me. Yeah. Arnie, we haven't talked for about five weeks. You're a regular on this program now and people seem to love to hear you uh, because I think they all really want to know what is going on in Fukushima. So can you bring us up to date now, um, after five weeks, about the latest findings and uh, and problems at Fukushima, Ani? Um, well, I think the single biggest thing that happened on the plant site is, the, um, uh, is that TEPCO announced that um, a, a large part of the nuclear core melted down from uh, its normal position and melted through the nuclear reactor. Um, it, it seems that Unit 1 is worse than Unit 2 and 3, but here's what happened. Um, when a nuclear reaction ends, when the control rods fall in, 5% of the heat is still there, not from any nuclear fission, but from all those leftover radioactive isotopes called fission products. So... 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're cranking out, um, you know, 500 megawatts like Unit 1 was, 5% is still, you know, 25 megawatts. It's, it's, a, it's a big number. Define a megawatt, Arnie. Well, uh, a megawatt is a, is a thousand kilowatts. It's a million, a million watts, right? Yes, it's a million watts. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, um, or it's um, a thousand one hundred watt volts, you know, something like that is one megawatt. Um, so the, uh, there's a lot of extra heat that has to be gotten rid of. And uh, Unit 1 failed to get heat into the nuclear, uh, failed to get water to cool the heat in the nuclear core real early in the accident. And um, the fuel began to disintegrate. Uh, in the process, it cranked out an enormous amount of hydrogen gas. And the, um, the net effect was it exploded. We all saw that on the very second day, March 14th. Um, and then uh, after that, of course, uh, it was obvious that the core had collapsed, and that's a meltdown. Now, uh, some for the longest time, I was saying that it was melting through the nuclear reactor, but TEPCO was saying, no, it didn't get out of the nuclear reactor. In fact, it's likely that it got out of the nuclear reactor um, within a day. Uh, well, describe the, describe the nuclear reactor vessel. What is it? How thick is it? What is it made of, Arnie? Well, the, the bottom of the nuclear reactor is a, is a bowl, and it's about eight inches thick. So that's, um, oh, I'm converting here, Helen, 30 centimeters um, Made of thick. what? Made of what? And it's made of um, a steel. Yeah. Um, but in a boiling water reactor, it's got 64 holes in the bottom of it for the control rods to go in and out. And what I believe happened is that the, the, the nuclear core, the molten blob at the bottom of the reactor, didn't have to melt its way through eight inches of concrete. And, of course, TEPCO's position is, well, it took a long time to melt through those eight inches of concrete. Concrete so or steel? Position, steel? Oh, steel. 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 I, sorry. Uh, yeah. I need my cup of coffee here. Uh-huh. Uh, 
but uh, my position is that it went through one of the holes, and oh. the holes are easily accessible, and it would have drizzled out like um, soft ice cream. Oh. Um, and if one hole failed, it's one thing, but if a whole bunch of holes failed, uh, a lot of nuclear um, core not only escaped and, and, and fell to the bottom of the reactor, but also rapidly escaped from the bottom of the nuclear, the, the steel, and, and got to the bottom of the uh, containment. Now, the bottom of the containment is about a meter of, um, of concrete. And um, by, now, by this time, after about a day, instead of 5% decay heat, you're down to about 1% decay heat. But that's still, you know, 5 megawatts or 5 million watts of power. Um, and it started to melt its way into the concrete. Most likely, it didn't melt concrete, but concrete pops like popcorn when it gets hot uh, because there's oxygen in the, pop, in, the, in the concrete. So as it got hot, it would um, pop and disintegrate, pop and disintegrate. And the core has gradually worked its way into the concrete underneath the nuclear reactor. Now, this is, we're talking about 70 tons of nuclear material. This is a, a large molten blob of nuclear material is underneath the reactor. The question is, uh, how deep did it go? And it, it really depends on um, when it broke through the nuclear reactor, and I think it broke through soon, but also if it, if it began to attack in a narrow area, it would form a crevice. And if it fell through more uniformly, it would form a pancake. Well, a pancake would be easy to cool because there would be a large surface area. But if a crevice was formed, it would lie in that crevice and uh, continue to work its way downward. Now, by today, so now we're eight months into the accident, and we are at less than one megawatt. So from 25 megawatts to 10 to 1, we're at less than one megawatt of decay heat. But... It's in a. Um, it's now created a crater essentially, and uh, can't be cooled from above because um, it sort of sealed itself off on, on the top, and it's um, gradually working its way uh, down into the um, through the concrete. Now there's a. They claim there's about 30 centimeters left, about a foot left, and um, they also claim that, of course, when it gets through the concrete, there's still about two inches of steel in the nuclear containment. Now, that, that will melt quickly. The concrete will take a lot longer than the steel to melt. So um, it is possible that over time the core will continue to melt down um, and, and get through the, um, the, the nuclear containment. You know, but whether or not that happens, I, I think um, we're not going to have a steam explosion. The people keep talking about, well, when the core hits the groundwater, uh, there's going to be a massive steam explosion. Uh, there's not enough heat left, less than a megawatt, to cause a massive steam explosion. And I think it'll drizzle out. I think it will um, uh, gradually come in contact with water and solidify, as opposed to an enormous mass hitting water suddenly, in which case you would get a steam explosion. But um, I, I think the real key here is it doesn't matter. The nuclear core is leaking through the containment anyway. It doesn't have to melt down itself into the groundwater. There's so many leaks in that containment into other buildings and out into the ocean anyway that all of the water is in contact with the nuclear fuel. And so, therefore, the plutonium and the cesium and the strontium that's in the nuclear fuel has run throughout the entire complex anyway and is getting into the groundwater. So it's moot whether or not we have a real meltdown, melt-through China syndrome. In my opinion, we have a meltdown and a melt-through, which is core collapses, gets through the nuclear vessel. And whether or not it ever has a China syndrome doesn't matter because the groundwater is already contaminated because the containment is leaking elsewhere. That was a very long-winded beginning uh, uh, comment, Helen, and I sort of apologize for making it that long. No, it's fascinating, Arnie, um, to hear from you. Now, but these are all calculations because they can't get near this molten corium 
nuclear mass. They don't really know what's going on. So how can they assume by which calculation, what calculations are they using to work out the data that you just presented? That, that's a great question. You know, you're right. They can't get inside the containment. The containment is so radioactive that they haven't even opened the door and let the robots in yet. They've been outside the containment, and the exposures are incredibly high. So, you know, engineers just make a series of assumptions. Well, uh, and, and there's, they can't get within 100 feet of this to verify. So there is no way of determining where that nuclear core really is. And, um, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I teach geometry, and the, and the word assume, A-S-S-U-M-E, uh, I always tell my geometry students it makes an ass out of you and me. <laughs> oh, well, so we don't really know. Okay, so now... Unit 2 and 3 had cooling for several hours longer, and it was uh, the first reactor had something called an isolation condenser, and that was the old, the oldest way General Electric built these reactors was just an isolation condenser. They realized early that that was not a good idea, so on the next two reactors, they put a turbine that runs on the steam created from the accident. And that worked for a couple hours longer uh, until it failed also. So they were cooled by this turbine for a little bit longer. Oh. And um, as a result, uh, TEPCO says 90% of the nuclear fuel is melted in Unit 1, and 60% has melted in, in Unit 2 and 3. It's still an enormous amount of nuclear material has broken through the nuclear reactor and is on the floor of the containment. In but in the, all three, in all three yeah. units, one, two, and yeah. three. Yeah. Okay. Now, the groundwater and the amount they they've put into the ocean. I I want you to address that um, specifically now, Arnie Gunderson. Well, they had a leak um, just this week on. Um, uh, in, in, their, uh, in the system that they use to purify the water. And approximately um, uh, 45,000 uh, 45, pounds of radioactive water was released from the building and uh, got into the Pacific Ocean. And it was very high in strontium. Um, and strontium, of course, you'll remember as a bone seeker and, and uh, is, is one of the most nasty uh, chemicals that gets released from a nuclear reactor. So that was a surface leak. It, it ran out of the building, across the ground, and into the ocean. Oh, really? Got yeah. it. But, but in addition, there's cracks in the concrete from the earthquake. You've got to remember, this site moved. It dropped a foot after the oh. earthquake. The entire land dropped. And when something you know that big moves it's got a crack so mm. there's cracks in the uh, in the containment there's cracks in the turbine building mm. and all of which is allowing groundwater in and radioactive water into the groundwater so the site is becoming increasingly um, the groundwater under the site is becoming increasingly contaminated and is the groundwater uh, seawater is it salt water it must be because it's built right next to the ocean right uh, no, it's fresh water. Oh, it's the, fresh water. The, the, the flow is from the land into the ocean. Uh. It, it just turns out that way. So that um, there's fresh water under the site, and the net flow on site is out into the ocean. Now, so we're seeing whatever radioactivity is in the groundwater is also moving into the ocean. So you know, as it's been said, I said it months ago, but other people have now said it too, that this is um, the... the absolutely the largest, by at least a factor of 10, um, radioactive contamination of the ocean that's ever occurred in history. Well, how much do, have, has, do you estimate has been released into the Pacific Ocean in toto from, from Fukushima Daiichi? Well, the, the number I saw was uh, 30 Petra Becquerels. And that's that's fifteen zeros. So put thirty with fifteen zeros behind it, becquerels, and uh, that's what they believe was released into the ocean. A becquerel is a disintegration per second, but after that disintegrates, there's another one the next second, and another one the next second, and another one the next second for years. So we talk about you know this thirty with with fifteen zeros behind it. It's a million billion. 
mm. 30 million billion um, disintegrations per second, continuing over the next 30 years, um, have been released into the ocean. Now, is that is that again a calculation and an estimate? Everything's an estimate. How do they how do they work that out then? How do they work that out, Arnie? Um, you know, the, I, I don't like the assumptions they're using on these calculations. The, the biggest assumption is something called the decontamination factor for cesium, and they're assuming that one only one atom out of a hundred gets out of the nuclear reactor and in out of the nuclear containment rather and into other buildings. Um, I think that's a miserable assumption. Uh, they 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 have a DF a decontamination factor of 100. So that means 1 in 100 gets out and 99% remains behind. Uh, it's a poor assumption, and uh, um, but it, it, it serves TEPCO's needs. You know, they really want to minimize this accident, and, and a 30 with 15 zeros is as small as they can, they can get the number, apparently. Goodness me. You know, when I think as a physician, you know, and a patient in the ICU with, with profound septicemia and blood poisoning, uh, you could minimize it, but the truth is um, <laughs> the patient may be absolutely swarming with lethal bacteria, and despite how much antibiotic you give them, they're going to die. So it doesn't matter if you minimize it or not. The reality is that you probably lose the patient because you're not dealing with accurate data, right? You're absolutely right, yeah. And um, uh, unfortunately, both the Japanese government and... Tokyo Electric have the same motive, and that motive is to minimize the radiological consequences of this uh, of this accident. And uh, you know, TEPCO just yesterday offered uh, eighty thousand yen for every person within thirty miles of the plant. That's a thousand dollars. That was their their settlement number. Oh, that's number. big of them. <laughs> Now, we've destroyed your, your entire state, the, the, the prefecture of, of uh, Fukushima, Fukushima. And, um, uh, and for your troubles, we'll give you a thousand dollars. Yeah, that's uh, uh, th so they want to minimize the health risk and minimize the radiation risk to minimize the amount of money they have to pay to the victim. Well, let's go back to the ocean uh, contamination, Arnie Gunderson, um, and, and almost certainly the thirty. Peter Becquerel's is an underestimate, as you said, and a Becquerel continues to disintegrate each second, so it's 30 tetra Becquerel's each second for, I don't know, decades or more. Now, talk about what that means to the seaweed, which the Japanese love, and the fish, and talk about the fish swimming thousands of miles, talk about the fact that the EPA is not testing the fish that are being caught on the west coast of Canada and the United States. Can you address that issue, please? Uh, yeah, we're seeing that the radiation is is not only coming out from near the plant, you know, it, 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 and obviously there's an awful lot coming out from near the plant, um, but now it's also washing down from the mountain. So we're seeing um, the radioactive cesium and strontium coming down from the mountain streams and um, collecting in the, in the sediment in the mountain streams when they get to the shallow spots right near where the ocean meets the stream. Um, and, of course, that's where the fish love to eat, in that, in that shallow transition between the ocean and the, uh, um, and, the, and the freshwater. So we're seeing behind dams, we're seeing behind rocks, any place where the water gets a chance to settle out, we're seeing very large quantities, especially of cesium. That seems to be what they're most looking for, but, of course, strontium would be there, too. We're seeing large quantities of, uh, of cesium in the soil. Now, this is uh, uh, fascinating because the, um, the International Council on Radiation Protection assumes that strontium is dissolved. In other words, it's Cesium or strontium? That to both, I'm sorry, cesium and strontium yeah. are dissolved. And let's go to cesium first. Uh, that, that the cesium is dissolved in the water uniformly, mm. and it just kind of washes out into the ocean. That's not happening. Ninety percent of the cesium is trapped in, this, in very small, muddy um, hot particles. 
And, of course, those hot particles lie in the bottom and get absorbed by the root structure of the seaweed, which gets eaten by little critters and works its way up the food chain. And cesium is a, is a muscle seeker, and strontium is a bone seeker. So we're seeing cesium in the fish meat, and we're seeing strontium in the fish bone. Now, the Japanese actually eat fish with the bone, uh, the bone as well as the meat. And also, of course, if you cook a stew, you're going to also um, cook, the, cook the bone. Um, so uh, there's a danger not just of eating what's in the meat, but also the strontium that's in the bone. Um, and now this is working its way uh, into the ocean, not just at Fukushima, but 100 miles north and 100 miles south, because it's running out of the mountain ranges nearby. Uh, so we're seeing um, relatively large fish on the order of um, uh, five or six inches, 20-centimeter, 20, 20 centimeter, 15-centimeter fish um, already with, with high concentrations of cesium. And, of course, those fish are eaten by bigger fish, and eventually it works its way up to the tuna and the salmon and the mackerel at the top of the food chain. And I think it will be, you know, next year before we start to see the... Um, uh, you know, highly contaminated tuna and mackerel and salmon. So I'm eating as much uh, salmon as I can this year because I'm a little bit concerned about what will happen next year. Yeah, but what, what about the fact that the EPA is not testing the fish caught on the West Coast and probably won't? And, you know, what does that mean? Oh, I know. It's a travesty. I, I think, of, you know, we have in our ports in the United States, we have monitors on the ports to look for nuclear weapons coming in and things like that. And it's likely a year from now that a, a, a truckload of tuna will fire off a radiation oh. alarm uh, because it's loaded with cesium. And I think at that point, hopefully, there'll be a, a whistleblower at the docks to uh, alert the authorities. But you're absolutely right. Though. The, the government's response, the United States government, the Japanese government, and really governments throughout the world, their response to this incident has been to minimize it, because there's just way too much money on the line. It's obscene. Now, you now, Ani, as a nuclear engineer, it's not just strontium and cesium. Please talk about, you know, there are 200 isotopes, radioactive elements made in the reactor, some of which last seconds and some last millions of years. So what, other, what, what are the other common elements that are being tipped into the ocean at this point in time? Uh, wow. I, I, Come I, on, Ani. I... <laughs> I, I I don't know how one. Ruthenium, <laughs> ruthenium, americium, neptunium, plutonium, uh, uh, carbon americium. Four, americium, carbon fourteen, tritium. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are so many. Ra uh, yeah. Cobalt sixty, almost certainly. Um, radioactive silver, and you just need to get a periodic table and, and look at all the elements and look at their half lives to see how long they last, and then you extrapolate and, and radioactive iodine-129 with a half-life of 17 million years. I mean, this sort of thing. All they're measuring at the moment, it seems, is cesium, you know, which talk about is an it, indicator, but, it, but it's an indicator of so many other things that they're not talking about. Yes, you're right. And there's an, another example is that strontium is emitted from the nuclear reactors, and after 30 years, it decays, but it's not to a stable element. It decays to yttrium, and yttrium decays 12 hours later. So you essentially, when the strontium decays, it's a double hit. You know, you get the strontium decay followed rapidly by the yttrium decay. So there's, uh, uh, you know, there's a witch's brew of chemicals in the ocean. Witch's brew. You know, there's a, a, another thing. You recall last time we talked, you you spoke eloquently about the uh, um, the the. The xenon-133 um, isotope in the airborne contamination. And we just got information that during the first week, so this wasn't just a, a passing clown, but during the first week, people in Fukushima Prefecture were exposed to 1,300 becquerels per cubic meter of, of, of 133. You know, that's medical level, as, as you were you know, discussing last time, about fat solubility and all that kind of stuff. So it, it concerns me that um, we, um, it, the one, they, they obviously should have evacuated much further, much faster. But there's, there's an exposure 
that's being underestimated. The Japanese are saying, they, they didn't listen to our show last month, Helen. The, the <laughs> Japanese are saying, well, it's a noble gas, so therefore don't worry about it. But, uh, but as you discussed, you know, it, it's fat soluble, it gets in your lungs and, and in your tissue and, and hangs around for quite a while. Yes, and also if you're immersed in a cloud of of xenon one three three, you're also receiving high level gamma radiation externally, like high level X rays, as well as inhaling the xenon one thirty three that is absorbed through the lung and, and goes to fatty tissue, exposing gonads, ovaries, and testicles, and other such organs to um, high level gamma radiation. But it's not just cesium. Arnie, there are three noble gases. One is xenon, yeah. oh, not cesium, I mean xenon-133. There's argon and krypton as well. And they're all yeah. high-level gamma emitters as well. So, they're, you know, as is, they only talk about cesium in Japan and maybe strontium. They're, not, they're ignoring easily, you know, up to 100 other in extraordinarily dangerous um, radioactive elements all of which have different life cycles in the biological system and in the human body. Um, you're you're that, absolutely right. And then to add to that list that you just gave iodine, if the, if if there was if there was xenon one thirty if if there was um, xenon one thirty three, there clearly had to be iodine yeah. too, and and that means thyroid exposure. Oh yeah. Now, okay, so now we should get on to what what they're finding cesium in. Baby's powdered milk. Um, yeah, that was produced. Um, I don't know, two hundred miles or two hundred k from the reactor. Talk about that, honey, and that they've had to recall four hundred thousand cans of powdered infant milk formula. Talk about that. Um, well, you you basically touched on it all. There was a. Um, they just now discovered, and it had to be there earlier, but it just now measured. Uh, somebody finally looked at powdered milk and discovered uh, you know, high levels of cesium in the powdered milk. Um, there was a recall, although the Japanese government is saying, uh, well, it, you really can live with this level of radioactivity in your body. Um, it, it's interesting because they're making the uh, radioactive banana analogy. And they're saying, well, when you eat a banana... You have potassium-40, and so you're taking in a radioactive isotope, a naturally occurring one. So this is nothing more than eating just a few more bananas. Is that what they're but, saying, is it? Yes, that's what the Japanese government said. Jeez. And, and of course, it's absurd because uh, your body is in um, uh, has a stable relationship with potassium-40. What you take in, you excrete out. And it's just a, a, a normal part of your, your everyday uh, yeah, metabolism. Yeah, but it also could be producing its radioactive and it could be producing some of the cancers that we see already because there's no level of radiation that's safe and that's background radiation, which is responsible for a fair numbers of cancers, not just the potassium-40, but the radon and radium and everything we live with every day. And that obviously induces uh, some or quite a few of the cancers that we see and have seen for thousands of years background radiation. Yeah. But if you add to the background radiation by poor having cesium in infant formula, let me just extrapolate a little on this, if I may, Arnie, as a paediatrician. Fetuses are thousands of times more sensitive to radiation than adults. Infants are hundreds of times more so because their cells are rapidly dividing and it's during the process of mitosis and cell division that genes are very vulnerable to being damaged by radiation, hence it can induce cancer. Children are 10 to 20 times more sensitive than adults, and the nuclear industry uses a standard 70 kilogram white young male uh, as a standard for the amount of radiation to which people can be exposed. But the population is heterogeneous. It's you know it's got old people who are very sensitive. It's got immunocompromised patients who are very sensitive. It's got fetuses, children, and the like. So let's talk about cesium in infant formula. <laughs> cesium is you're right a potassium analog, and it goes to muscle and brain, and it causes a very rare form of muscle sarcoma 
rhabdomyosarcoma, which is very malignant and extremely dangerous. It also causes brain tumours. It causes ovarian cancers, uh, testicular cancers, um, and other cancers throughout the body. Now, because these are babies drinking the formula, they're innately sensitive. And from what I've read, the Japanese government says it's nothing to worry about. You know, it's just a little tiny bit. And but, but that is antithetical to anything we know about radiation biology. I can't understand how these people are getting away with with this nonsense. Well, yeah, I, I'll just touch on that. You know, the ICRP, the International Council on Radiation Protection, and the um, the, the uh, International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. Um, are, are not going to correct it um, because they have that dual role of promoting and regulating. And, and right now it's much more important to promote nuclear power than it is to regulate. Oh, nuclear Arnie, nuclear. I, I just, this just takes my breath away. I mean, how many cancers are we going to see from this accident? I, I predict probably millions. People might think... I'm at a, I, I'm at a, a million myself. I, I firmly believe that uh, in the first, 20 years of the of the incident, we'll see at least a million uh, new new additional cancers above and beyond what you'd expect for a population of that size. Well, certainly, 25 years post uh, Chernobyl, the estimate is more than a million. And Chernobyl, they say, is was an accident that was less severe than Fukushima. What, how would you compare Fukushima now to Chernobyl, Arnie Gunderson? Well, they they say that. Uh, um, again, this is all calculations, Helen, because it's all assumptions. Nobody had radiation detectors to figure it all out. But they say that the total releases from Chernobyl were 75 tetra becquerels, so million billion. Well, we already know 30 got in has already leaked into the Pacific, and so it's even using TEPCO's numbers were essentially identical to um, to Chernobyl. But actually, the, the problem is that, that the population density around Fukushima and you know, through Japan, mm. it was much greater than the population density in the Ukraine where, where, where Chernobyl occurred. Mm. And, and frankly, the Russians got people out a lot faster than the Japanese did. So you've got higher population and a, a much poorer response for emergency planning um, from an exposure that was at least as much. Frankly, I think it was more. But even using Tokyo Electric's number, it's at least as bad as um, as Chernobyl. Um, so, yes, I, I think if you use the Chernobyl numbers and scale up by population density, you'll definitely have more than a million cancers. Yes, and, 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 and we must always remember the accident has not yet finished. That's right. That's right. You know, you mentioned the, the let's go back to the cesium issue for, for a split second. Uh, you know, your body is not in equilibrium with cesium. Your body is in equilibrium with potassium-40, which you take in, you, you excrete out, and you're in equilibrium with it. Cesium is, you're, is not a naturally occurring thing. It was not meant to be in your body, and it replaces potassium. It's a potassium analog, like you said, so that the... Um, uh, and cesium is a much more powerful um, amount of energy it releases on every on every decay than potassium as well. So the, the, the Japanese um, uh, comparison in trying to minimize the fact that there's cesium in the milk um, to a very radiosensitive population, the very youngest Japanese, is uh, is appalling, if you ask me. How do you think the cesium got in the milk? They're saying that, you know, they had it drying and it fell on the drying milk. But I suspect as the cesium got into the beef, radioactive beef, that the, after the cows ate uh, rice hay or rice straw that was contaminated, that the milk itself was radioactive. Would you agree with that, Arnie? I agree. Yeah. Uh, the, the cows are radioactive and yeah. the milk is... They're not sampling all the cows. I mean, initially, all they did was rub the hide of the cow. Oh, really? The hide came up, yes, the initial test on cesium um, for, for the cattle were to rub the hide. They didn't even look at the Good meat. God. Now, now they're looking at the meat, and, and oh, my God, now they have to look at the, uh, at the milk. So, um, yeah, and they're only sampling a, a few cattle in a herd. They're not sampling the entire herd. But I think you're right. It came from the food. 
you know, the rice straw is contaminated. We're now at a point where almost all the rice in Fukushima Prefecture has been judged to be um, not usable. Um, so that, um, you know, it's, it's on the ground and, and has contaminated as much as, you know, 10 or 15 percent of the entire nation of Japan. Um, I, I read that um, 50 percent of the rice grown in Japan grow, is grown in Fukushima Prefecture. 50 percent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. At, at least 50 percent in Fukushima Prefecture. Yes. Yeah, so uh, is uh, it, is no longer um, yeah. fit for sale. Now, and, uh, Arnie Gunnison, um, the I want you to talk about how much of Japan is contaminated. I've read two different estimates. One is that 50 percent of Japan is now contaminated with radioactive fallout, but another estimate sh- said it was 8 percent of the land. In Japan is contaminated. What 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 do you say about that? Well, I think it depends where you set the criteria. You know, if they if you call contamination, um, uh, you know, a thousand becquerels per square meter, um, you'll come up with one number. But you know, the Japanese consistently are raising the allowable amount. They raise it. They're lowering the bar um, to, to make more and more of the land habitable. Um, so it really depends on what you consider to be um, a, a reasonable amount of, of radioactive cesium to have on the on the ground in uh, you know in your backyard. Um, but I, I have uh, I it's pretty clear that um, almost all of the entire prefecture of Fukushima uh, is so contaminated that the best solution would be to uh, to remove two centimeters, uh, five centimeters, rather, of soil for the entire prefecture. And that includes the mountain ranges. There's there's an article in the New York Times from December 6th that discusses the fact that they may have to clear-cut the mountain ranges to then get to the soil so they can decontaminate the mountain ranges. Because if they don't, 70% of Fukushima prefecture is mountain ranges. So if they don't clean the soil... Uh, it will continue to run into the into the rivers, and it will continue to get airborne with passing storms and gusts of wind, and they'll never get to the root of the problem. The New York Times also said that there's going to be parts of um, Fukushima Prefecture that will, uh, if if people ever return, it will not be in the lifetime of the people that are there now. So we're talking about, you know, 50 or 60 years until people can return to some of these areas. Well, the fact that cesium has a half-life of twenty of, of uh, 30, years 30 years and lasts for 600 years, it's not just, you know, in their lifetime, it's, it's many, many generations. And that's true for areas around Chernobyl, too. Um, I had another... You know, they're counting for it to, to also wash away. They're not going to not just going to decay away, it's going to wash away. Um, and, uh, of course, that then throws more of it into the ocean in the long term. But, but Arnie, the, the decontamination is a myth. I mean, you can't decontaminate land. Where are you going to put the, all the soil, that you know, the millions and millions of tonnes of soil you've dug up to dig a deep hole and put it, and then it's going to leak into the underground water system, then rise up into the streams and recontaminate food chains uh, for the rest of time. You can't decontaminate land. You can't. And what they're doing is ploughing um, school playgrounds and, uh, uh, you know, and, and amassing large quantities of the soil. But it's kind of like Port Hope in Canada, which is extremely contaminated. They say they'll just you know, remove the contaminated soil and bury it somewhere else. You can't get rid of the radiation. You can't get rid of it. I, I think well, it's Well, they're talking amiss. about if they just did the habitable, the portions that are inhabited in Fukushima Prefecture, and, and I agree that that doesn't solve the problem, but if they took off five centimeters, two inches of soil, yeah. for the habitable portions of Fukushima Prefecture, they would fill up 50 stadiums the size of the New Orleans Super Bowl. Uh, Superdome. Um, it's a it's a huge stadium in 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 New Orleans in Louisiana, uh, and of course that doesn't include the mountain range. Mm. Some Japanese scientists just came out. Uh, I can't believe they said this, but they actually said, "Well, the best solution would be to take the dirt that we that we um, 
scrape off our land and uh, take it out into the ocean, yeah. where the ocean is at least 2,000 meters deep. So, uh, you know, 6,000 foot ocean, a little more than a mile, and dump it in the ocean. That's their, their solution. Yeah. There's a lot of international treaties that the Japanese are signatories to that prohibit that, but yet, you know, academians in, in Tokyo believe that a solution would be to dump it into the ocean. I can't believe, Arnie Gunderson, that there is not a push, a concerted push by international scientists who understand what's going on to blow the whistle on what the Japanese government and TEPCO are doing, you know, rather than, you know, evacuating hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, they are, if you can't lower the water, you raise the bridge, they're saying, well, look, it's okay now to live in areas which are polluted to thus and thus radiation, whereas before it was illegal. I can't understand why there isn't an outcry from from international bodies who understand what's going on. Can you explain that? Um, I can't either. You know, I'm working with some truly independent scientists, Tim Mousseau, who you had on earlier, and, and, and others. Um, I'll give you an example, though. We have, we, we've been working with, with uh, Marco Kalthofen, and uh, he's at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And uh, uh, we've been analyzing. People have been sending Marco. They, they contact Fairwinds, the, the, the website that, that uh, Maggie and I uh, run, and we give them shipping instructions, and they ship car filters to, to uh, Mr. Kalthofen in, in Massachusetts, and he analyzes them in a in, in uh, several sophisticated uh, devices. We've gotten some car filters from Fukushima Prefecture that are so radioactive that he, Mr. Kaltofen, has to dispose of them as radioactive waste. We are He's shipping these car filters to a radioactive waste dump in, in I think, Texas, you know, where they bury it under 30 feet of soil. Mm. So these air filters from Fukushima cars are so radioactive that in the United States we consider them radioactive waste. And yet the Japanese are doing nothing to warn the auto mechanics who are removing those air filters. Um, There's a lot of money on the line here, Helen, and and I'm afraid that within Japan, TEPCO and the Japanese government are are closely affiliated and don't want um, TEPCO to go bankrupt. I, I believe... I believe this will be about a $250 billion cleanup. And uh, you know, no one has ever spent that kind of money on a cleanup before. Well, and, and of course, within the United States, we've got a, a regulator in an industry that, uh, that also want to uh, perpetuate and increase the number of nuclear reactors worldwide. So there's a lot of financial pressures to, uh, to minimize the effects of Fukushima. Well, you know, it's interesting talking about car filters. <laughs> what about the human filter? And that's the lung. So you could extrapolate from those car filters to human lungs in Fukushima province. And that those people must have been inhaling huge amounts of radiation because with each breath you inhale it as the car filters suck it in and it's not excreted oh, over time. It might be a little bit by the cilia washing it out in the bronchi. But, but but the lungs will be accumulating a large quantity of radiation like the car filters. Yes. And actually, um, what we've done, Helen, on the um, Fairwind site, um, back, at the, back on um, October 31st, uh, I did a summation of, uh, of Marco Kaltofen's speech. But just this week, here in early December, uh, there was a professional photographer who, who did a video of Mr. Kaltofen's speech and we put that on our website. And he talks about that. In, in the presentation to the American Public Health Association, um, Marco Kaltofen discusses the fact that these car filters are absorbing just about the same amount of air per day as a human lung. Yeah. And here we have to dispose of these car filters as radioactive waste. Yeah. And, and what, what isotopes, elements, are being found in the car filters? He's just, he's, he is not analyzing uh, for, for strontium because it's difficult to find. Uh, and he's, um, it's a, he's, all, he's found americium, he's found uh, um, uranium and, and some others. But predominantly, he's looking for uh, cesium-134 and 137. 
And those are occurring in, in identical ratios, rough, roughly the same amount of cesium-134 to cesium-137. And that's a, a, a sure indicator that what he's measuring came from Fukushima. Mm. You know, the industry would say, oh, well, this cesium's been around since Chernobyl or bomb testing before that or whatever. But, uh, but what, what Mr. Kaltofen's looking for is the, the ratio of 134 to 137. 134 decays much faster. So that if they're both there, it's clear that it came from Fukushima. Um, but clearly there's a lot more uh, uh, isotopes than the uh, than the ones that I'm talking about right now. So cesium-134 has a half-life of, what, 2.5 years, Arnie Gunderson? Yes. So it's around for, oh, what, 10... So 10, 20. 10 to 20 years. So, yeah. And and it's so pretty, it's and it, is it is it a more high energy gamma emitter than cesium one thirty seven? No, they're both um, uh, actually it's predominantly a beta. But, oh, it's a beta. Uh, it, oh. Yeah, they they both emit beta and gamma. Yeah. Uh, but um, one thirty seven has a rather unique um, uh, gamma peak, which makes it easy to find. So, you know, when you're trying to determine a rough magnitude of the problem, one of the easiest isotopes to look for is cesium-137. And, of course, when you find that, then you look for the 134 with the sophisticated instruments he has. We're not talking about Geiger counters. He's using, you know, $50,000 devices that are cooled with liquid nitrogen and things like that. So um, it's a it's a very uh, high-tech uh examination he gives these air filters. Well, so what, what reaction do the American Public Health Association have to this rather extraordinary presentation by Mr. Kaltofen? Um, they applauded it and went to the next speaker. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think, though, um, his ending point was the fact that um, from a public health standpoint, we need to expand uh, our emergency planning zone. And you know, that pressure is building up here in the United States and worldwide. The concept of, uh, of a nice linear, you know, everybody within 10 miles has to leave, and after that you're okay, uh, clearly has been you know, destroyed by the accident of Fukushima, where, in fact, some people in the 10-mile zone didn't have to leave as fast as other people that were 20 or 30 miles away because of the direction of the wind. Mm. And we don't take that into account with emergency planning. Oh, I know. And it's I know. It's... I think you know, Mr. Kaltofen's uh, ending remark was: we really need to reevaluate emergency planning, and uh, and consider uh, the fact that these these plumes uh, meander and they they move and um, and they can very quickly get out to thirty miles, and we're not prepared to. Um, uh, to move people out. You know, I was on CNN during the first week of the accident, and I was saying I think it's unconscionable that we've got women and children um, in that 30-mile zone. We've got to get them out, and yet, of course, it didn't happen. Well, during Chernobyl, the winds changed 360 degrees within the first 24 hours, and the accident went on ferociously for about 10 days and, of course, contaminated 40% of the Europe. European landmass for, you know, 600 years. So um, the plans to evacuate people from 10 miles or, or whatever are surely ludicrous. It depends upon the meteorological conditions and, and the NRC doesn't take that into account. I must say, though, that the chairman of the NRC, Greg Jasko, who worked for Harry Reid, the Senate, former Senate Majority Leader, seems to be saying a few fairly basically intelligent, sensible things. Would you agree with that, Arnie Gunderson? Um, yes, he's the... Um, actually, the nuclear industry considers him, you know, a, a rabid anti-nuke because he uh, told people to evacuate out to 50 miles. Um, and, uh, you know, that was... Uh, he was chastised here in the United States because of, uh, because of his comments. So that... Um, um, but in fact, I think his comments have been incredibly reasonable, mm. and he hasn't, um, you know, and he hasn't backed down from. Them. So I give him credit for uh, at least in emergency planning, having uh, you know some pretty reasonable comments. So, Andy Gunderson, um, to to finish, what are your predictions about what is going to happen in the future at at Fukushima? Yeah, I don't think there'll be any massive explosions of. Uh, 
radioactive corium hitting groundwater or anything like that. I remain concerned about earthquakes because uh, all the buildings are unstable, mm. especially the Unit 4 reactor, which has the nuclear fuel way up high. So a severe earthquake, you know, a 7, 7, 5 or something like that, um, can conceivably topple the fuel pool on Unit 4. And uh, if that happens, we're, we're back to the very first day of the accident. It's an incredibly serious problem. So that's my biggest concern on site. Um, Offsite, I think we've been over it. You know, the, the decontamination efforts have been haphazard, underfunded, and uh, underappreciated by the Japanese government, and they need uh, um, they need to really commit. You know, I, I think I've said it on, on your show before. You, if in order to solve a serious problem, you have to admit you have a serious mm. problem, mm. And, and that hasn't happened. Uh, I want to ask. If there was such a serious earthquake as you just suggested that could damage Unit 4, what would happen to Units 1, 2, and 3 in the, in the Corium molten mass if there were a major earthquake? Um, well, all those buildings are unstable, but the, uh, the most unstable uh, building is Unit 4. Um, you know, Unit 3 is a mess, and... Uh, that's the one that had the most serious uh, explosion. And um, so is um, uh, Unit 1 to a lesser degree. So um, it's possible the containments could breach. It's possible that more radioactive steam could be released. Mm. And it's, um, it's, but but um, the, there's no science to discuss what would happen if a nuclear fuel pool collapsed like at Unit 4. Mm. No one's ever analyzed that. Mm. So that, um, you know, my biggest fear moving forward, and, and it's a low probability, the, the chance of a, of a Richter 7 earthquake, are, 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 uh, so they have a lot of sixes on the site. And apparently, as I understand seismology, for every 20 sixes, you get a seven. So they're beginning to push the envelope as far as, uh, you know, expecting a, a, a seven magnitude earthquake. Mm. And uh, an earthquake of seven or eight can... Uh, um, can topple that building, and the fuel uh, uh, is, would obviously be uncovered. And it's um, it, we're back to the Brookhaven National Lab study at that point. Brookhaven National Lab uh, did a study that if a fuel pool was uncovered, um, it would uh, begin to burn and could uh, could kill 187,000 people from the. Uh, uh, from the plume of radioactive smoke that would come out of the fuel. So if the if Unit 4 were to topple, and, and again, this is not a, a, a done deal. This is a 1 in 100 or maybe even a 1 in 1,000 event. Mm. Um, but but still, considering the, the severity of the problem, the uh, uh, you know, when you have these high prob- low probability, high consequence events, they get quite frightening in my mind. Uh, the unit four, um, the chance of unit four toppling in the event of an earthquake is, in my opinion, top priority for Tokyo, Tokyo Electric to try to solve. Okay, so f- the finally one last question, Arnie Gunderson. <laughs> After Fukushima and Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, what is it going to take for these nuclear nuts? to get the message to realize that nuclear power is totally inappropriate, but more than that, extraordinarily medically dangerous. What is it going to take? Well, you know, I, I've been talking more and more and more. My, my concern is that, uh, let's use North Anna for an example. North Anna had an earthquake here, and it was a six. And the plant was designed for a six, and the plant survived the six. And uh, now the nuclear industry is puffing up and saying, wow, look, we, we survived what we were designed for. And, and of course you survived what you were designed for. You're engineers, after all. But the six it was designed for was supposed to come once every 23,000 years. And, in fact, it happened after 30 years. Mm-hmm. So the problem is we're not taking into account the, um, the, what Mother Nature can really throw at us. And uh, until we adequately assess what um, uh, what Mother Nature can really do, um, uh, the design of these plants has got to be questioned. And uh, uh, we can't feel comfortable if uh, North Anna survived a six because it already had a six. And, and again, we get to that issue of low probability, high consequence accidents 
Um, and uh, we really need to reassess the, the worst that Mother Nature can throw at us. And, you know, the, the experts the industry hires are, um, just like at Fukushima, are uh, told, told Tokyo Electric, told the Japanese government that uh, a six-meter tsunami was the worst you could expect. And, in fact, they got a 15-meter tsunami instead. Uh, my, my biggest concern moving forward is that we've really, across the board in every country, have underestimated the severity of, uh, of a natural phenomena. Yeah. And I would, I would end by saying, Ani, that until there's a proper meltdown in America, the industry will proceed. No comment. That's a terrible thing to say as a doctor, isn't it? Terrible yes, thing. Yes. Yeah. I hope it doesn't happen. You I, know, know. I go to bed at night. I go to bed at night praying that what I think is happening is wrong. Oh, honey. You're a lovely man. You are. And one of the few who can really, really explain concisely and logically what's going on. And I really thank you very much. And uh, obviously, we'll have you on again to follow events as they proceed. Well, thank you, and let me pitch the Fairwinds website here just for a minute and uh, thank all the viewers who worldwide have watched the Fairwinds video. We, we really appreciate all your comments. Thank you, Arnie. Okay, bye-bye. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was Arnie Gunderson, an energy advisor with over 30 years of nuclear power engineering experience in the United States. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with you again next week. Bye for now. You've been listening to If You Love This Planet with Dr. Helen Caldicott. This program is broadcast on community radio across the United States, including our host station, KPFT Pacifica, Houston, Texas. This program is produced and engineered by Jazz Williams, co-produced by Scott Powell, and our publicity and outreach are coordinated by Amanda Bellerby. To listen to previous shows or to make a donation, go to our website, if you love this planet.org.